Hey again, Zach Rosette with Buildbox. I'd like to welcome you to part two of the Make Your Own Game series. In part one, we got a lot of work done on our game Glitch. We used the creator to build a playable skeleton of a wall jump game, and we dropped in a ton of graphics to customize it. Although we are not going to actually build levels until part three, everything we discuss here in part two is the foundation of level design. Additionally, we're going to discuss editing the collision shapes for the graphics we dropped into our game Glitch in part one, as well as how to bring a new enemy into our game and bring it to life using the object settings and the object components. All of these topics will lay the foundation we need to actually begin building our levels in the following video. First thing we need to talk about is collision shapes. Collision shapes are what Billbox uses to decide where objects interact. For example, my character looks like it hits the wall and has stopped because the collision shape of my character has collided with the collision shape of the wall. Without collision shapes, the graphic from my character would just fly off the screen, and that's no fun. Let's start with the character in the Assets panel to the far left. Select the character and you will see the global options appear in the Options panel to the far right. Directly above the default animation of any object or Billbox character is the button for editing the collision shape. Go ahead and click on that button to open up the collision shape editor. The first thing we want to do is get our object nice and big in the editor so we can get it as precise as we can in editing the collision shape. You can resize this window too, so get it nice and big on your screen. Just like in any other editor in Buildbox, the mouse scroll button will zoom us in and out, and holding down the space bar while we click and drag will move the editor around. So let's get that nice and big and in the center, and you'll notice almost immediately our collision shape is incorrect. This orange shape here represents what Billbox will use to determine at what point an object can interact with something, as well as what occurs when that object interacts with another. What we want is the collision shape to match the graphic. Clearly we have the right shape already because our character is circular and we replaced a circular graphic. The super easy fix is to just drag it so that it's centered. To move it, simply grab it in the middle and put it where you need it. Let me just show you some of the options in the collision shape editor. The upper left is where we can choose between a polygon shape and a circular shape. Now we can move the points around to get a more precise fit. Additionally, we can add points as well as subtract points and even reset the image if we've made a mistake. Let's go back to the circular shape and use the middle handle to move it around and the outside handle to resize it. Now whenever I create collision shapes, I want to make sure they are a bit forgiving. This will lessen the chance of the user feeling cheated when they get killed, deciding the game is unfair. Also, when you give the user leeway with collision shapes, being more generous on platforms and making them smaller on obstacles, they experience excitement. Close calls elevate a user's excitement and helps to improve their enjoyment of your game. Next, let's close the collision shape editor for our character and go over to the asset panel and select the walls. Bring up their global options to the far right in the options panel and edit the collision shape. As you can see, this one is very accurate, but if we had come in here and it was off, we could easily fix it by using the reset button as a starting point. Close the editor and we'll move on to the enemy graphic we dropped in for the triangle enemies. Select the enemy in the asset panel to the far left and the global options appear in the far right in the options panel, allowing us to edit the collision shape. Let's get our graphic nice and big and centered. As a reminder, you can resize this window to take up the whole screen if you need to. You can see the collision shape the creator automatically generated for our original triangle enemy. As you can see, our triangle has its original collision shape. Despite this, this is already a great starting point for us. Let's start at the top and leave a little leeway so people don't feel cheated and instead get excited about a close call. Let's drag this lower left one onto the corner and add a point. Billbox is now telling us that collision shapes must be convex. This means that any angles inside the collision shape must not exceed 180 degrees. As you can see, this inside angle has indeed exceeded 180 degrees, or a straight line, and because the character cannot fit inside this area here without touching one of these tips, we're okay just allowing the collision shape to share the tips here. Although we are not being precise with our collision shape, that doesn't mean we can't make a composite object with more precise collision shapes, which is more advanced practice that we'll go over in another video.
For now, let's select our top point and add another point. The Add button always adds a point clockwise from the one you have selected. Let's move these last two into position. In this area here, I wouldn't want a player to hit this and think there was nothing there to hit and ask why did I just die or quit the game. For that reason, let's just make sure there is plenty of leeway. I will show you why this works based on how we are going to face this graphic. Also keep in mind we can get very precise, but I will show you that in another video. But for the sake of time and instruction, let's just give this last point here plenty of leeway. Now let's open one final object we have in the asset panel, our one-way platform. Let's just drop in the same graphic we use for the walls so it looks the same. We can make it so that we can move through this object in one direction, but not the other. Let's start by hitting the reset button, and on most square graphics, you're likely done. Notice the big green arrow on our collision shape? This denotes pass-through and can be turned on and off up here in the left-hand corner next to the shape menu, and it can be moved in any direction. This allows the character to pass through the collision shape of the object in the direction the arrow is pointing. If we want to pass through an object for some reason, make sure the arrow is pointing in the direction you want the character to be able to pass through, and the collision shape will be ignored by the character. In any other direction, it will hit, but in the direction of this arrow, the collision shape will be ignored and the character will be allowed to pass through. Using this functionality creatively can lead to some very interesting and unique game mechanics. Now that we've made sure that our collision shapes are where they should be and that they match the graphics, it's time to show you what debug mode is. I had mentioned in part one that this button in the upper right hand corner was debug mode and that it was a more advanced feature. However, now that you are familiar with collision shapes, this will make a whole lot more sense. Turn on debug mode to reveal the collision shapes for all the objects in the game. Let's duplicate one of these mountain-like enemies and make it nice and big for us to see. If I zoom in, you can see that the collision shapes are exactly what we modified them to be. Not only is revealing the collision shapes a creative and helpful element of level design, it is also extremely useful for testing. At some point, you're going to get knee deep into a game and realize you keep hitting something or falling off something or you'll keep dying on something that you can't see. You'll be face planting into your keyboard wondering what is going on and debug mode is going to save your sanity because it is also available in the preview window. Let's play our game to preview debug mode in the preview window. Click on preview to play our game and debug mode is up here in the upper left. We can turn it on right now, but in menus that only contain images and no actual objects, there are no collision shapes. Play it and see what debug mode does for us. If there was something you had in the middle of the screen that you kept hitting even if you had a completely invisible object, the collision shape will still show. This is extremely helpful when testing in comparison to debug mode turned off. You can see that despite not being able to see what is causing our character to die, turning on debug mode allowed us to see the collision shape blocking our path. That's a quick overview of collision shapes and debug mode. Now let's bring in a new enemy so we can discuss object settings in detail. Object settings will make the world and character settings we discuss in part 3 make much more sense and get you prepared for the actual building of your levels in BuildBox. Buildbox is drag and drop, and in part 1 we dropped in a sequence of PNG images for our character's default animation. Similarly, to bring in a new enemy, all we need to do is select its entire default animation sequence and drag in the entire sequence into Buildbox. Buildbox will present us with the drag and drop wheel and will hover over the object option and Buildbox will create our new enemy object complete with the animation sequence we selected as the default animation. Let's select our new object in the asset panel to the far left and bring up its global options in the option panel to the far right to edit its collision shape. Given the option to choose between a polygon shape and a circular shape, the circle would work best with this enemy. Let's have a look at our new enemy in our game. Okay, he's there, but you'll notice if we hit it, it doesn't cause us to lose a life. Let's make sure it's set up as an enemy. That way we have to avoid it. We do this by changing the object's properties by selecting the object and revealing the options in the options panel. We already selected our new object in the asset panel and brought up the global options, 
But next, we must get the enemy to behave correctly in its respective in-game scene. Select the object we want to modify to bring up the object's properties in the Options panel. The first menu displays some presets to use. Select the enemy and drag it around. You can see the position settings change. The position is of course the position of the object in the scene. Similarly, the same can be said of the rotation. As I click and drag and rotate the object, you can see it changing in the options panel. Now understand that we can change options in a precise manner by typing in the position, or you can design by look and feel by clicking and dragging. Go ahead and verify that rotation is reset to precisely zero. Now you can see the same occurs with the scale. When I grab the handles and move it around, the scale changes in the options panel. But notice what happens when the scale is set to negative. The object flips. We are going to use this later, so keep that in mind, but for now, let's change the options back to a value of one. We can also modify the opacity of objects. If this object needed to be see-through but not invisible, we could change the opacity to 0.2 for 20% visibility. However, we're going to change it back to use one for now. Another possibility is to give this new enemy movement. As it is now, it's just a fixed object in our scene running its animation. It's set up as an enemy and we'll need to avoid it, but we could go even one more step further and give it movement. To begin discussing the movement settings, let's start with linear velocity. The linear velocity settings are set up with the first row of variables representing the x-axis, and the second row of variables representing the y-axis. You can also see two columns for these variables. To get started on some of these movement settings, let's put a negative three in the x-axis and we will see our enemy move at the speed in the negative direction on the x-axis. Additionally, the higher the absolute value, the faster he'll move in the respective direction. Let's move that negative three to the y-axis and have a look at that difference. It's moving down now, and if we make it a positive three, he'll move up. Given the game's direction and in a creative way, if the value of its speed is changed to 13, it will stay on screen longer, thus increasing the difficulty for our player by increasing the amount of time our player needs to avoid him. The first column, the angular velocity, is a neat setting and the simplest explanation as to what it does is place an object in orbit. Input 100 in the angular velocity setting and see how it behaves. It looks like it's in orbit around an invisible force. The higher the number entered, the tighter the orbit. A very low number, like 4, will have a giant orbit and have a pleasant arc to its movement. Compared to the first column, the second is slightly more complex. The first column changes behavior based on exact numbers. The enemy will behave under those exact guidelines. In contrast, the second column determines randomness. For example, if we reset all of the variables in the first column to zero and put a 10 in the axis randomizer in the second column, our enemy will now choose a speed of 10 units on either side of zero between negative 10 and positive 10. Also, it will be a random number every time the enemy appears. Duplicate the enemy and see how three different versions each have a unique random number. To easily duplicate the object to the left, remember you can use W, A, S, or D to duplicate objects and scenes. Holding shift while dragging will arrange them in an orderly line. Take a look at their behaviors. Some of the enemies are going up and some of them are going down some left, some right, this random quality can add an element of surprise and break up the monotony in your game. The current values work well in this game, however if a 50 is inputted into the x-axis setting and a 10 remains in the randomizer, the character will choose a random number between 10 units on either side of 50. So essentially anywhere between 40 and 60. So there are creative ways to use that randomizer when the time comes. Let's get back to all zeros in the left column and 10, 10, and 15 in the randomizer column. That covers movement fairly well. There are two more settings here, one for collision type, ours is an enemy, so we want to leave it set to collide, and then the destroy type. Because it is an enemy, there needs to be a minimum value set to destroy the character. 
Hypothetically, this enemy could lay waste to anything it touches using destroy all. That may work in a different game, but it will remain set to destroy only the character in Glitch. Object components are options you can add to any object in the game. The first option is Wake Up. The Wake Up component allows objects to lay dormant unless the player character moves in closer proximity to the enemy or touches it. Because these objects are enemies, collision-based Wake Up won't work. The player would die at the moment of the collision. If this was a platform that the player needed to jump on for it to move after the player collides with it, this is the setting that would create that game mechanic. For the enemy, select Distance Based. Distance Based is measured in pixels. If the enemy needed to lay dormant until the player is within 300 pixels, entering in a 300 in this Wake Up Distance setting would achieve this. When previewing the game, the enemy lays dormant running its default animation until the player reaches that 300 pixel threshold. Then it takes off using random numbers assigned to it. 300 pixels is a great value. It's just close enough to be a surprise and coupled with the random numbers, it's fairly low movement settings create a nice difficulty to start with. If the enemy needed to return to being dormant after the player moves 200 pixels away, this could be achieved by enabling the sleep setting by selecting distance based and entering 200 in the sleep distance. When previewing the game, the enemy will return to being dormant while the player retreats to safety. If the enemy takes off away from the player, the moment it wakes and gets to that 200 pixel threshold, it will stop dead and now become an obstacle creating an additional avoidance mechanic. There are several different mechanics that can be created using the sleep option. Now let's delete this wake up component and I'll show you the other component. You can add two objects in the game using the spawner component. As you can see, we have the same two columns structured to the settings, so exact behavior in the left column, random behavior on the right column. And this is measured in seconds, so if we leave the spawner to its default, let's see what happens. As you can see, it spawns additional copies of itself, and with that one in the settings, it will spawn every one second. If we set a very low number, say 0.2 seconds, it unleashes an army of swirling death at probably an unfair pace. Let's use the setting wisely. One thing you'll notice now is the original does not show when you add a spawner component. Only the spawn clones will show. If we had our enemy spawning off screen and then coming into play, that wouldn't matter. But I'll let you in on an early tip and trick and hack right here. We can select the enemy and press Control C or Command C to copy it, and then Control V or Command V to paste it. You can copy and paste any object into any scene anywhere in any world. Next, take the spawner out and remove the animation settings. It's simply an overlay for the spawned versions behind it. When hidden in the outliner, you can see the version with the spawner component has an arrow symbol as a way to show that it has a live spawner component. Input a 5 in the random column for our spawner component and see how the enemy behaves. It's assigned a random number between 0 and 5 seconds and it chooses that number at the time it spawns the current one. This allows you to easily create a string of really quick spawns and then a string of some that might take a total of five seconds. It will be completely random. Additionally, there are settings here that allow you to set the object to only spawn when the character is shooting or jumping, but it'll remain set to permanent, meaning nothing affects its ability to spawn except for it being awake. Next, let's combine the two components. Change the wake up settings back to 300 pixels to wake as well as 300 pixels to sleep. In the next video of this series, we are going to get into the world settings and character settings, as well as create more levels for Glitch. Remember, if you need help with anything you see in this series, you can find more helpful videos at buildbox.com. I'll see you in part three.